the title of the presentation is Rethinking Taxation in the Digital Economy. Uh, I think uh, Dr. Urbeta and, and uh, Dr. Sheila has already uh, underscored earlier uh, the importance of the topic. As to you know, as as to the the sentiment regarding taxes, that is you know that is very understandable. Um, although you can you know we can try to reframe taxes um, uh, as what uh, Mark Twain uh, said: "This is the price of civilization." Right? Uh, I, this is this is an extraction from us. Sure, this is a burden, but it also makes you know it also makes. Um, uh, uh, Civilization possible. Our schools, our roads are are, are based on uh, taxation. All right. Uh, next slide, please. Next slide. All right. So, just an acknowledgement. Uh, this research was not, you know, uh, conducted in a vacuum. Uh, uh, I consider this a this study as the latest in a series of PIDS research work. So, I, I it was built on a foundation of earlier um, research from the PIDS regarding this sector. And in particular, uh, the work of Dr. Cuenca, um, which is concerned about uh, defi defining the digital economy, right? In, in law, that's, that's, that's usually the first problem, right? You want to tax something, you want to regulate something, you want to punish something, but first, right, uh, as, a, as, a, as a legal principle, we have to define it. Uh, we need to be able to establish you know, the conceptual boundaries of the thing that we are subjecting the law to. And uh, of course, we, you know, we want to tax uh, the digital economy. What is it? What is the digital market? It's actually very, um, it's, it's actually a hard problem uh, trying to define, trying to ring fence what constitutes digital markets or the digital economy. It's a complex, multifaceted uh, uh, problem, right? Especially now, since uh, with, with everything, you know, with many traditional businesses, you know, many traditional methods of doing things, going online, going digital, right? Uh, we have, you know, if, if, if our definition of what is, what constitutes a digital economy is, is, um, uh, is too careless, then we'd end up taxing everything else, right? Everything is digital. And so everything can be, you know, can be taxed as a digital, as part of the digital economy, right? And then uh, I'm, I'm taking concepts from the work of Dr. Serafica, uh, uh, also from the PIDS. Uh, her approach is that, um, okay, the we may not be able to define you know, the entire digital economy or digital market, but we can identify you know, particular value chains, right? Uh, the movement of value from certain sectors of the economy to another that are associated with the digital economy, right? And so uh, you have to you have to locate the flow of value not just in in firms that we traditionally associate with the digital economy, right? The websites, the apps. But they're also, you know, they're also associated with you know, things like payment systems, logistics providers, advertisers. Right? Uh, the value moves uh, through these uh, firms as well. And then from attorney uh, Serzo, uh, she covered a lot of problematic taxation, uh, digital economy taxation scenarios in her, in her, in her PIDS paper. Uh, and my takeaway from this is that you, know, you you can't avoid the cross border nature of digital transactions even even in those that are ostensibly local uh, and so ultimately uh, it's it's an international law problem that will require an international law response okay. next slide please so uh, Businesses in the digital economy, they have attributes that pose serious challenges to the tax law that we have, right? Uh, first, you know, these, uh, some participants in the digital economy, particularly uh, some platforms, they can achieve large scale without taking on a mass of physical assets and inventory. 
Uh, related to this is they are you know, they are reliant on on intangible uh, assets you know, such as IP and software and data. So of course you know um, large online companies would have a would have a stock of physical assets. You know, they would have office equipment, they would have computers, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But you know the bulk of their value right, is not in the physical assets. They're in the um, intangible assets moving through their systems, right? The data, the software. Uh, while these new businesses, business models, uh, at the same time, these, these business models erode the need for physical proximity to their target markets. They don't even have to establish a home office here physically in the Philippines. Um, New, new technologies uh, facilitate tax avoidance through the shifting of profits by multinational enterprises to low or no tax jurisdictions. Um, taxation of activities that constitute the digital economy is therefore a complex problem, right? Uh, because, next slide please. Uh, it's a complex problem because, you know, even though the new, the leaders in the digital economy don't rely on physical presence. Uh, tax jurisdiction has traditionally been based on physical presence. You know, tax law is based on the notion of uh, physical presence, either physical presence of the entity being taxed or physical presence of a vital component of the transaction itself. So, for example, a common uh, principle in bilateral tax treaties is that one is considered to have earned his income in the place where one is physically present, right? And so the taxation rights are allocated based on the physical location. Um, legal residence, usually defined in terms of length or regularity of stay in a jurisdiction, often serves as an index for physical presence. Um, on the other hand, in the case of a corporation, you know, which is a legal entity, it has no physical body, and so how can it be present in a jurisdiction? It is nevertheless deemed you know, through legal fiction to have a physical presence right, based on legal criteria of connection or nexus to, to the jurisdiction. So uh, the emphasis of on physical presence uh, in in law, or in tax law in particular, is based uh, on long-standing principles such as the principle of you know, territoriality of law. Right, uh, law can only be, you know, it's, it's only effective and 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 it can only be enforced in the territory of the you know, of of the sovereign authority that passed that law. Right. Uh, it's also based on the principle of due process, right? Uh, the power to compel, right? To compel an act or to do something based in the law, it's based on notice, right? How can you be notified if you're not within the jurisdiction? Uh, how can you be actually reached, right? Uh, how can you be apprehended as a legal subject within the jurisdiction, right? So for most states, uh, the physical presence you know, is not just the conceptual basis of jurisdiction. It's actually the means through which meaningful jurisdiction can be exercised, right? You can only be identified and therefore you can only be subject to surveillance and then therefore you can only be made you know, subject to actual tax collection, right? Uh, and, there, and you can only be sued, right? Because you have a physical presence within the jurisdiction. So uh, jurisdiction and meaningful exercise of jurisdiction is usually based on physical presence. Uh, next slide, please. So the country's uh, national internal revenue code, you know, like most tax laws, enshrine uh, the above principles uh, of Physical, uh, physical presence, right? In, in the case of income taxation, a, a resident citizen of the Philippines is liable 
to pay taxes for income earned from both local and foreign sources, right? Because he's a resident citizen, right? He's here. A non-resident Filipino citizen, on the other hand, will have taxable income from, from for sources within the Philippines, right? He's not here, but the sources are here, right? So these rules are mirrored for corporate counterparts. A domestic corporation, like a resident citizen, will be liable for taxes on income derived from within and outside the Philippines. Uh, a foreign corporation's taxable income, on the other hand, includes only those sources from the Philippines. Uh, it should also be noted that the organization of the state's tax apparatus uh, reflects the paradigm which is built around physical location. You know, the tax administration of the BIR uh, is spread across revenue districts that are organized and responsibility is allocated based on you know, geographical assignments, right? The revenue district office, right? Has, uh, is in charge of a particular you know, location. Right? So, you know, to be able to determine who gets to act on a particular tax matter, we have to determine first, ah, nasan ba yan? You know, for purposes of tax law, right? Where can that, you know, where can that, um, that, that taxpayer or potential taxpayer be located, right? To, to be able to determine, right? Which RDO is in charge. Uh, next slide, please. So this traditional tax regime can be enforced, you know, reasonably well, right? For income based uh, on brick and mortar businesses, yeah? even when a foreigner is a counterparty to the transaction. So, for example, a non-resident foreigner, such as a tourist, you know, can purchase goods in the local store. They, they come in here, they fly in here, and while uh, being a tourist, they, they, they buy something from 7-Eleven, right? So the local store records the transaction as part of its income, which is reflected in its tax return. On the other hand, the store is also essentially deputized to impose VAT on its products and charge it on customers. So these are obligations are enforced through a system of tax administration measures that are tied to physically locating the subject of taxation or its place of business, its assets or information, right? So we have you know, a, a, a tax authority, such as the BIR, has tools. We mentioned tool set of things that it can use to, to find the value, you know, um, extract the value, and then if 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 the taxpayer does not is not willing you know to move against the taxpayer uh, itself right so uh, what are those tools well we we have a system of tax registration right uh, businesses individuals are, are are required to register with the bir right and and um, often for example right uh, for businesses the issuance of a registration certificate Right? along with its annual renewal, is a precondition to being issued a business permit. So both the BIR registration and the business permit are required. Right? And they're even required to be prominently displayed right, in the place of business. Um, but it, you know, it, it touches that, that requirement requires you know, application within a physical, you know, a physical space. Right? Um, another way of... Um, uh, of of enforce, enforcing tax liability, uh, you need to have a point of sales permit, right? If you're a business and you're, you, you have a, a point of sales machine, uh, that machine has to be uh, registered and permitted, right? Uh, the application process will require the business to submit technical information on the machine, right? Uh, even the, the receipts that you issue, right? You need to have a permit to be able to print and issue receipts, right? And then uh, the, BIR, the BIR also conducts you know, the physical mapping and inspection right, of businesses. And so it is aware, right? It's supposed to be aware of uh, the physical location of taxpayers, right? Uh, and finally, of course, uh, if, if things go wrong, the, if the taxpayer is not willing to pay, right? Then uh, the exercise of jurisdiction is still based on physical location, 
right? Uh, the BIR will find the store, right? The BIR can close the store, right? The BIR can you know, seize the assets, uh, sue the, the the owner, and you know physically uh, ask the court to physically detain, right? Uh, the taxpayer. Next slide, please. So uh, just uh, just an overview of um, efforts already underway uh, in this space in terms of legislating a, a, a tax uh, for digital uh, for the digital market. Right? Uh, so le local legislation is is pending. Uh, I think we have post uh, digital services tax. Uh, it's only moderate. It's essentially, you know, it's, it's essentially a Netflix tax, right? Uh, uh, to be imposed on 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 digital subscriptions, right? Uh, it involves the imposition of VAT that will ultimately be borne by local users. Uh, at the same time, we have clarificatory circulars uh, to accommodate the income of local uh, locals participating in the digital economy. So, just to clarify. Right, uh, whether or not your your um, uh, whether or not you're online or offline, if you are a if you are a local, if you are a local business, if you are a resident citizen, then you're still ordinary taxpayers, right? Uh, and the, the circulars just clarify how they'll make it you know, they'll make it work. Uh, on the other hand, for international taxation law. Uh, the current approach uh, of for for taxing cross border transactions is based on a network of bilateral treaties. Right? Uh, we don't have an overall multilateral treaty framework. Uh, embedded into these treaties, however, are rules and concepts often relevant uh, that of that often become irrelevant when it comes to digital businesses, right? Uh, because like I said earlier, digital business business models provide opportunities to structure activities to make them more tax efficient. Right? Uh, a digital service or product may not have a physical presence in this country, uh, but the customers are present here, right? And the revenues are generated here because their users are here, right? So you can say that there's an economic nexus. A digital business can distribute its assets across multiple jurisdictions and structure its activities in a fragmented manner to enable tax optimized location of profits and use you know, treaty shopping to avoid permanent establishment status uh, so that you know, they can attribute the main parts of profits to favorable jurisdictions. Right? So, you know, it's possible, you know, it's possible with, with the digital economy for a firm to fragment its business, right? The marketing is here, the production is here, uh, the, you know, the management is somewhere else, and, you know, you can structure it across several jurisdictions in a way that, you know, that, that is tax efficient, meaning I will, I will place those activities in a place that, you know, that, that has the lowest tax for that particular economic activity and I can still run the whole thing right through digital technology right but in a way that will uh, uh, avoid you know uh, taxation or or, ma or maximize the efficiency of taxation right uh, uh, so even when a physical nexus exists it does not have a presence that can make enforcement meaningful right the digital business can operate extensively Within a country, but require only minimal footprint. Like, like for example, I can I can establish a data center. Right, it operates, but really, it's the footprint can be minimal. Just you know, uh, just a couple of engineers and computers. Right. So even if the state moves against the company, right, it can only you know it can only seize right uh, only a few assets. Right. Uh, Right. So the problem, you know, even you know, becomes even more difficult when not just the business, but even the medium of transaction is virtualized, right? Uh, like the currency being used as a medium of exchange, right? 
uh, along with entities and intermediaries that are that enable payment and settlement are online, right? They don't they don't even need to have a bank here, right? The payment system is also online. Uh, the goods and services being purchased are also virtualized, right? Uh, I can't even the government can, can't even seize your assets because your assets are are online. Next slide, please. So primary uh, problems when it comes to um, international you know, cross-border transactions and the taxation thereof. Right? Uh, one primary mechanism through which bilateral treaties try to establish the issue of double taxation. So uh, those treaties are in place you know, just to prevent double taxation, right? Uh, so it's it's the the country where the, the the company operates and the country where the company is from, right? They they try to you know they try to reach an agreement on allocating the power to tax, right? uh, And that allocation is based on the concept of a permanent establishment, right? Which was developed during a time when every business was you know necessarily a brick and mortar uh, business. So physical uh, establishment is uh, defined as, you know, the fixed place of business, right? Through which the business of an enterprise is wholly or partially carried on. So a corporation's income and profits will generally only be taxed in the country where the corporation maintains a physical establishment, right? Uh, but this concept was developed long before the internet, long before e-commerce. So as a result, digital corporations today may generate profits in more than one country, but can avoid paying taxes in one or more of those countries because they don't maintain a physical presence, right? Uh, they can just fragment their business activities, you know, in a way that minimizes the physical presence. Uh, in other words, a country does not have the requisite jurisdiction to impose taxes on internet-based corporations because a website or internet server does not necessarily qualify as you know, sufficient permanent establishment. It, it's not a fixed place of business under this concept. Uh, furthermore, uh, like I said, right, we don't have a universal multilateral treaty. Uh, it's going to be different from state to state based on the network of bilateral treaties that they have entered into. And so corporations you know, sort of perform shopping, right? They, they re rely on the inconsistency right, from state to state right? and the lack of an international overarching tax regime right, for, for cross-border transactions uh, to exploit the divergence in tax systems, right, in order to shift their profits uh, from one country to another, and then classify those profits as you know, uh, foreign source income. Right? So, as a result, uh, corporations take advantage of the relief mechanisms put in place uh, to mitigate double taxation, right, uh, and they're able to reduce overall tax liabilities. They're this in itself is not illegal, right? This is this is tax avoidance, right, or tax uh, minimization, which is not illegal, uh, as to whether or not it is, you know, whether or not it is um, acceptable politically, right, is another matter. Right? Uh, this phenomenon, as well as the set of practices used to perpetuate it, has been called base erosion and profit shifting, right. Uh, BEPS is the erosion of a corporation's ta tax base, which is used to determine its tax liability. And it is accomplished through a mechanism called profit shifting. Right? Uh, and also, you know, nowadays, uh, some corporations are in a position to, you know, to, to effectually tell countries, you know, uh, hey, uh, uh, this other country has a lower corporate uh, corporate tax, right? Um, I don't have a lot of you know I don't have a lot of footprint in your country, right? I can move out easily. So unless uh, unless you lower your corporate tax, 
then you know, I'm going. Right? And uh, what this has resulted is uh, resulted in is a is a race to the bottom, right, between countries who want to encourage foreign investment. So next slide, please. So uh, one particular solution that is you know, starting to gain some traction is the OECD uh, two-pillar solution. This has been uh, uh, widely discussed you know, uh, lately. Uh, and the two pillars in the, in the OECD proposal is um, first, a reallocation of taxing rights. Right? So they will revise. So instead of you know, individual countries entering into bilateral um, um, bilateral treaties, uh, we'll just have one system of profit allocation and nexus rules, right? Uh, so we'll, we'll try to settle on a formula, right? For um, right now, I think the way it's phrased that if 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 a particular company right has above normal profits if they have profits above a certain threshold right then uh, that above normal profit will be allocated not just to the home country of that corporation right but also uh, to the market country right the country where uh, the users are where the profits are from right uh, yeah so there will be new rules on 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 how to establish nexus based on you know, based on revenue model. So it would depend, right? Several online companies have you know multiple revenue models. Right? They have the advertising based model. You have uh, you have um, uh, you have uh, uh, something based on subscription advertising or uh, direct purchases. That could change. The nexus could change depending on the business model adopted, right? and of course, it will feature mandatory rules for uh, for binding dispute resolution. Right? Pillar two, on the other hand, uh, involves a global anti-base erosion mechanism. So there will now be a um, a minimum corporate tax rate of fifteen percent, right? Uh, below which you know you can't you can't go, right? So it, it will stop the race to the bottom between countries. All over the world, one minimum corporate tax rate. Right? Uh, and of course, uh, there are other solutions uh, in the EU, in the US, because they can, you know, they, they, are, they are powerful enough to be able to, you know, to impose uh, their own tax regimes, right? Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so now we go to the methodology of the of the study. Right? So, like I said earlier, this is based on uh, an earlier model from Dr. Cuenca and Dr. Serafica about uh, you know, about visualizing you know, not the entire market, but specific flows of value, the value chain, and the value chain can can be composed of multiple participants, right? Uh, you know, you buy, you know, you, uh, for example, right? The, the logistics drive, logistics companies and drivers are are involved at the at the far end, right? For to be able to fulfill, right, your orders. Banks and non traditional payment systems, right? Your PayMaya, your your GCash, right? They are also involved. You're part of the value chain. Um, there will be, you know, players such as advertising networks, content developers, your influencers are also involved, right, in promoting the products or services. Um, uh, those products or services, they were built by someone, right? Uh, the platforms were, were built by someone. Usually there will be, you know, so the platforms are operated by a company. So you have your Lazada, your 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 Carousel, your, uh, your, your Shopee, right? Um, they have their own in-house developers, or they outsource, you know, uh, to some other you know, to some other company. And of course, you know, under, undergirding that is uh, uh, the infrastructure that makes you know that makes everything run, 
uh, from telecommunications to hosting companies. Next slide, please. All right. So when you make an online order, it's not really just between you and the ultimate seller. Right? Uh, information, information and value right, flows from the user to the seller right, uh, through these participants. Right? But not just money, right? Uh, what flows is control. What flows is information right, from one participant to another. Next slide, please. So what, uh, what we did for the study is to look at each, you know, so we look at each player uh, in, 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 that, uh, in that value chain. So all possible, you know, all possible uh, players in the value chain, or at least most of them. Right? Uh, and then uh, uh, we look at the possible revenue models for each participant right? because, uh, like I said earlier, right, some some companies have just one revenue model, but a lot of online companies have multiple revenue models, right? Do subscription, pay as you go, right, or direct purchases, right? So the structure, volume, and content of the value flows would depend on the revenue model adopted by the participant. Sometimes. The participant, the, the company does not participate in the revenue flow, or um, in a particular revenue flow, he's the buyer, or uh, sometimes in the particular revenue revenue flow, uh, iba yung level of participation, niya, right? So iba yung iba yung value na, na dumadaan. Right? So we map several types of revenue flows and variations on revenue models, right? Oh, next slide, please. And then for each revenue model in each participant, right? Uh, we look at the other participants that can be involved in the, in the transaction. So parang nag branch out na, right? So for example, right, in the revenue model for purchase and delivery of tangible goods, in yung, in yung online shopping na alam natin, right? Uh, uh, who, is, who are the actors, right? Who are involved, right? From end to end. Right in that value chain, right from end user, there's the online marketplace, there's the seller, right? There's the manufacturer of the goods, there's someone who provides payment, uh, you know, payments clearing, right? There's the technology provider, internet service provider, advertiser, and then finally the, the delivery driver, right? Who can you know who can uh, in charge of fulfillment, right? Next slide, please. So we looked at the flows of value amongst the participants you know, for, for any particular revenue model, right? So uh, from end user pays to the, you know, you pay, you pay to the, you know, to the, through, the, through the payment system to the platform. From the platform gives the share to the seller, right? Maybe a share to the advertiser, et cetera, et cetera. And then, you know, uh, part of that's the delivery fee given to the logistics company, which then goes to the driver, right? So it's about tracing the, the revenue flows, right? Next slide, please. And so each, you know, each revenue flow, right? In each revenue model, right? In each, you know, in each, uh, for each player, Right, can be represented as a matrix, as a, as a, yeah, as, as as a social metric, social matrix, right? Uh, so, if there is, you know, so the the top row represents the the actors, right? The first column represents the actors, right? And the intersection between actors, right, represents uh, whether or not there is a flow between them, right? So. Uh, if there's a flow, then we encode it as one. If there's no flow, we encode it as zero, right? For every, you know, for every uh, revenue model, right? Okay, next slide, please. And then, you know, uh, you can convert this matrix representation into something called uh, a, a graph, you know, a, a, a network model, right? Uh, so you can actually visualize. Right, uh, you can visualize the flow, right? But you can also look at the structure, 
Yeah. How how the how the players are structured. The more you know, the more flows come in or out of a particular actor. The more they are central to a network, right? Uh, and the more central they are, right? The more you can you know, the more you can um, yeah, the more you should be interested in them, right? Uh, this approach has been you know has been um, uh, yeah, is 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 used by you know by social network uh, companies, right? They analyze who are the central people, right? Ah, yes, the central people are the influencers. So maybe we can, you know, maybe, maybe we can talk to them and they can, you know, they, they, they can be the ones who, you know, instead of advertising to each and every, you know, to each and every member of the network, we'll just focus on the central people, right? Those influencers. Uh, the approach has been used, you know, uh, to be able to trace and eliminate terrorist cells, right? We... Uh, uh, we'll just, you know, uh, we'll just look at their communications traffic and see, you know, who receives the most messages, who sends out the most messages, and those are the central, you know, those are the central nodes in the network. And so we adopted the same thing with uh, when it comes to online transactions, right? Uh, who receives, you know, we we trace the flow of value and we were able to determine, you know, the structure, right, of these flows. Next slide, please. All right. So that's just the first level, right? Whether or not there are flows. The second level of the analysis is look um, look at you know each particular flow, right? So for each particular flow, is there a tax law, right? Meaning, is there is there a provision in the the Internal Revenue Code? Is there a particular uh, uh, circular, right? Is there is, is there a particular opinion, BI opinion that touches on those touches those flows that concerns a, a particular flow, right? Uh, but you know, uh, like I said earlier, jurisdiction is exercised in a continuum, right? Uh, there there are varying levels of jurisdiction. You can have jurisdiction and say, "Ah, oh, yeah, the law covers that," but you know you need to have methods of enforcement, right? And so we we tried the the second level of the analysis you know, involves the determining whether or not for a particular flow of value there is a law that covers not just the mere attribution right to the source, but is there is is there a legal provision that covers computation? Is there a legal provision that covers a surveillance mechanism for that particular flow? Is there a provision that covers enforcement in case of delinquency, right? So we consider this as occurring in a in a continuum, right? Uh, having a law that recognizes that attributes um, uh, the flow of value as taxable is just one. It's just the starting point. That's just the lowest score. Uh, if there is computation, then okay, that's two because that's a higher form of jurisdiction. That's a higher form of enforcement. If there is surveillance, then additional score. And finally, if there is um, uh, enforcement mechanism in case of delinquency, then you know we give uh, a, a, a the highest possible score. Right. So that applies to each and every flow. Right. Next slide, please. And so, uh, yeah, uh, those are the things we look at, statutes as well as the issuances. Next slide, please. Uh, okay, so, uh, so instead of just zeros and ones, right? You, you remember our, our, our matrix earlier. Uh, instead of just zeros and ones, those numbers will be replaced by you know, the score, you know, whether or not you know whether or not um, the the level of enforcement is there, and so instead of you know instead of uh, a, a directed graph, you have you have a weighted directed graph such as this one. Notice, right? Notice that some lines are thinner, right? Because they have a low score. Those flows are are recognized, but they're just that we we, re we, rec we recognize those flows as taxable, but we don't have the mechanisms in place to compute to survey and to finally to enforce, right? 
Uh, next slide, please. Okay. Right. Um, so we analyze, you know, we analyze the the flows and the visibility, right? The enforceability of uh, those flows, of taxation of those flows. Um, and so we 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 got our own evaluation of of the the structure of the of particular um, value chains. At the same time, we you know, we checked with some key informants, you know, just to just to see you know, if if our um, insights are you know are tenable. Right. Next slide, please. Next slide. Okay, so findings. Uh, platforms are central. You know, platforms uh, they include online marketplace, streaming services, gaming sites. They occupy a central place in the network of value flows. So if if you can remember, yung A two dun sa dun sa network graph, right? Uh, those are the platforms. Uh, their location in the structure aligns with the intuitive notion as expressed in most of the proposed reforms, that platforms should be subject to you know, some uh, tax obligations. Yeah. So given the increased wealth and power of these online platforms, government can make the policy call of subjecting them to uh, additional tax obligations. On the other hand, a, you know, when you say a platform, this, this does not just mean the the online shopping platforms. So they include streaming services. They could also include the payment systems, right? Uh, so uh, the platform's location in the network is characterized by both inflows and outflows, right? This suggests that in addition to being the ultimate recipient of value in its own right, a platform is also an intermediary, right? Passing forward payments to individual online sellers. So, it could mean that platforms are just passing, you know, uh, passing the value forward, right? Not all the value goes to them. Uh, flows of value can also correspond with flows of information and control. So, hindi lang pera yung tumatawin. Also, levels of information, also control. So, this makes platforms uniquely positioned to contribute in other ways, right? So, online marketplaces and platforms can be deputized as withholding agents, right? Pre-computing the tax payable by its sellers, right? Because they have the information uh, and remitting the tax due to the BIR, right? So payment systems can also provide uh, uh, some information as to the income and purchases of actors in the network. Right? Uh, right. Uh, next slide, please. So we have you know, an existing system of tax administration that works fairly well, right? But this was developed and optimized for brick and mortar businesses uh, that can be fixed into physical uh, spaces. In, in, in a virtualized cross-border world, um, such as the one for digital transactions, the effectiveness of this existing measures are limited. Uh, the ease through which online accounts can be set up and deployed as digital storefronts, often anonymously, uh, by users operating from home, right? Homes which are not tax mapped, right? Uh, through and through platforms that operate abroad, so they provide a practical limit to the BIR's enforcement powers. Um, nevertheless, there are steps that can be taken to optimize existing tax authority. Uh, for some junctures in the value chain, right? So at the level of platforms and payment systems, um, as I mentioned earlier, they can be deputized. Congress can pass legislation that specifically concerns the central role of these platforms, providing additional tax liabilities or requiring them to act as withholding agents, right? So concentrating on these key participants can allow tax administration efforts to scale since each of these centralized nodes can provide information and control over a significant number of users. So we can, we can, go, we can go against each and every user, every seller, but that would not be efficient because they are all over the place. They're at, they're at their homes. However, right, the platform provides a centralized juncture. Next slide, please. 
uh, digital ready tax administration, right? So to verify compliance and with the withholding and remittance functions, uh, the BIR will need to obtain a greater level of awareness over both transaction data as well as the logic right, of these platforms. So this will be analogous uh, to the level of access that the BIR has over to the point of sales systems, right? So let's just translate you know, their POS level of access to the platforms. Uh, there is, however, a difference in scale and sophistication that will require the BIR to upgrade its knowledge base. So it needs to you know, really capacitate itself to be able to um, uh, to be able to interact and engage with these platforms. Uh, centralized digital platforms would, of course, have a higher volume of transaction data spread across more users. Um, these systems would be infinitely more complicated than on-site POS systems um, and could be distributed across several machines. So the BIR will need to have a greater competence, a greater understanding of online systems, uh, as well as you know, procedures for validating and processing voluminous data sets. So BIR will need to have a, you know, a, a ready you know, big data uh, capability. Right. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah. Uh, expanded scope for investigation and liability. Uh, the problem with, with with tax investigations and 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 enforcement right now is that they would have to, you know, they would have to be based on uh, some either a probable cause or a reasonability requirement. Right? If if the BIR goes against a taxpayer, right, the court can ultimate courts can ultimately look at you know, okay, you investigated, you started investigation, but why did you start investigation in the first place, right? You need to have, you know, you can't just pick up a random taxpayer and say, ah, we'll, we will now focus on this. Or you, can, you just can't select any taxpayer and say, well, you know, because we don't like this person, right? So there needs to have a, you know, either a reasonability requirement or a probable cost requirement for enforcement actions, right? However, right in 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 a you know when you have so much data right on on transactions often you know the analysis will be able to to yield you know some patterns you know so for example the, your your big data platform might be able to determine that you know it might it turns out that those who file too early you know, or, or a bit you know a bit too early uh, they are the ones who actually have, you know, uh, anomalies in their information, right? In, you know, in, and then, you know, if you if you eventually look at the info at their at their information, you might find that, uh, yeah, yes, this is they are engaged in tax fraud, right? Uh, but you know, uh, a court might be able to look at the at the investigative procedure and say. You started investigation because they filed too early, right? It makes sense from your data analysis, right? It makes sense from your data analysis. It might turn out that those are who are too early, their chances are they are engaged in fraudulent activity. This is just an example, by the way. Uh, so more often than not, analysis, right? Big data analysis will reveal patterns that may not, you know, may not meet the reasonability and probable cost thresholds required by courts. So I, I, I'm thinking as a matter of, you know, as a matter of um, uh, enforcement, courts would have to be, you know, would have to be informed, right? And courts would have to accommodate, you know, uh, lower thresholds of starting investigations, right? Uh, right now, because yeah, you need to have a complaint, you need a complaint based on re reasonability and probable cost. And, you know, sometimes, uh, we need to be able to explore those patterns in the data, right? Without necessarily identifying a, a particular person, right? So no no privacy uh, no no privacy uh, impact, right? To be able to even start investigating, and I think that's you know uh, that is a fair you know that is a fair use of of um, 
analysis and the data, but you know, it might take a while for, for the courts and you know the rules might need to explicitly carve out that yes, you know, uh, investigations and, and uh, determining liability can start out from those kinds of analysis. Right? So I'm, I'm recommending you know, um, additional rules, clarifying rules as well as training right, for both practitioners as well as judges. Okay, uh, next slide please, final, you know, final recommendation. Uh, engagement at the international level, right? Ultimately, you know, we, we can we can optimize what we can locally, but ultimately, cross you know, a lot of digital transactions are cross border transactions, right? Ultimately, will 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 come at at the wall at which you know optimizing local taxation authority, you know. Uh, can't go any further, and we'll need to engage at the at the international level. So I would recommend you know continued engagement with the OECD in developing their uh, and participation in the in the OECD two pillar proposal. I I, I think uh, uh, we have shown interest, although I think we have not we have not uh, formally joined the OECD uh, two pillar solution. Uh, although there is some discussion, right? Uh, next slide, please. Uh, yeah, uh, some directions for further research. Uh, we can uh, right now we just focus on 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 a few, you know, on just a couple of um, value flows. It's possible to conduct, you know, comparative flows, right? by country right or by actor right uh, the, the structure of the network might be different for us based companies for eu based companies for china based companies right uh, the second level of our analysis is also you know, a bit uh, uh, can also go further right because uh, not all legal responses are equal or consistently implemented we can actually look at not just the theoretical uh, capacity of existing law, you know, to be to recognize and tax those flows, but you know, look at actual practice to see if there is consistent implementation of the law. Right? Uh, and then, next slide. I think this is the last slide. So that that uh, wraps up my uh, presentation. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, looking forward to the reaction and the discussion later. Thank you very much.